Welcome to your lecture on human communication. In keeping with your reading, this lecture will cover three things, language production and comprehension, focusing on brain mechanisms, disorders of language production and comprehension, and finally, disorders of reading and writing. First, in the context of brain mechanisms of language production and comprehension, we will consider lateralization, language production, language comprehension, bilingualism, prosody, and also the um, phenomenon of recognizing familiar voices. As discussed in other topical units, uh, brain and behavior involves the coordinated integration of right and left hemispheric functions. Um, at the same time, we can have lateralization of certain functions. And um, so with language, it's still the case that both hemispheres are involved, yet we see that the left hemisphere typically controls comprehension and production of speech, while the right hemisphere controls activities such as reading maps, perceiving spatial relations, recognizing complex geometrical forms, organizing a narrative, um, the expression and recognition of emotion in the tone of voice, and prosody. So the split brain procedure, which was introduced at the very beginning of this course, obviously is a great tool, um, albeit a significant um, uh, invasion of neurological functioning for understanding the importance of this lateralization. Uh, the left hemisphere, particularly around the auditory cortex, represents ground zero for language function. And um, this is something that we know not merely from the split brain procedure, but also from um, studies of aphasia, which we'll talk about momentarily. But um, you can see from this illustration that at the top mid part of the brain near the front, we have Broca's area. This is important for language production. At the mid top of the brain, just above the spinal cord is the auditory cortex here uh, depicted three dimensionally in blue. At the middle back part of the brain and to the right of the auditory cortex in this two dimensional image, uh, is the Wernicke's area, which is important for language comprehension. We'll talk about these in more detail. Suffice it to say that language disorders often emerge from disrupted functioning in Broca's or Wernicke's areas. And this is what we mean when we refer to an aphasia. It's a disturbance in the comprehension or production of language. So what is involved when it comes to the recognition of people's voices, a, a sort of normal human behavioral function? So we learn at a very early age to recognize voices. Regions of the right hemisphere are particularly involved in recognizing specific voices. Phonoagnosia or phonagnosia is caused by damage to those areas. So here you see that while most aphasias involve um, problems with Broca's and Wernicke's in the left hemisphere, phonagnosia, the inability to recognize specific voices, is caused by damage to uh, the right hemisphere. In order to have language production and comp comprehension, we need to have a few factors in place. First, the individual has to have something to communicate, um, whether it be a current event, a past event, or memory, an imagined event. In any case, the occipital, temporal, and parietal lobes of the brain are involved in perceptions of current and past events. Although little is known about the brain mechanisms involved in imagination, this is likely to use the same areas. When it comes to comprehension, the recognition of words can be both auditory or visual, right? We can hear words and we can read them. And comprehension involves recognition of words using Wernicke's area in the left temporal lobe, 
but we must also understand the meaning of the words and the memories associated with those words. And so comprehension of the figurative aspects of language involves the right hemisphere. Again, a sort of integration combined with lateralization. And those figurative aspects include metaphors, proverbs, and moral stories. As you can see from this illustration, figurative language or metaphors involve activation of a brain region that's slightly caudal um, but encompasses parts of Wernicke's area. In this illustration you can see that the mapping of different language functions in the brain um, differs in people who are bilingual. So languages don't come to occupy necessarily exactly the same space, but adjacent spaces. And um, the illustration shows you that on the left, English naming, um, and on the right, French naming um, are slightly overlapping, but also slightly separate. And um, it's important to note that the majority of people are bilingual or multilingual. Some brain regions in bilingual individuals are devoted to specific languages, and some are common to both languages. So that's what I mean when I say that there are some areas of overlap. Um, and this is identifiable using not only imaging studies, but open um, uh, surgical procedures, such as what you see depicted um, in the illustration. Common and language specific areas are found typically in the frontal and posterior temporal or parietal cortices. Language specific areas are found in some more subcortical structures. Prosody refers to rhythmic, emphatic, and melodic aspects of speech. Those functions are on the right hemisphere. Um, it's likely related to musical skills, expression, and recognition of emotions. So that creative um, sort of uh, theme of right hemispheric functions. Broca's aphasia in the left hemisphere um, where there's damage can also cause deficits in prosody, however. In this illustration from an fMRI study, you can see that prosodic speech and normal speech occupy slightly different um, uh, uh, areas of the brain, uh, semi-overlapping, but um, mostly lateralized. In this part of the lecture, we're going to consider disorders of language production, more specifically um, Broca's aphasia, Wernicke's aphasia as a disorder of language comprehension. We're going to also contrast these against conduction aphasia, aphasia in people who are deaf, and also speech difficulties in stuttering. Broca's aphasia is caused by damage to the frontal lobe. This produces agrammatism, anomia, as well as articulation difficulties. What that means is that one can comprehend language better than one can actually produce it. There's also difficulty in using function words like a and the, and a reliance on content words like apple and house. Uh, it can also be caused by lesions of the basal ganglia, interestingly. This illustration uh, comes from the Boston Diagnostic Aphasia Test. In this MRI scan, you can see that the superior temporal lobe is involved in pure word deafness. This is in contrast uh, to Wernicke's aphasia, where we know that there's a receptive aphasia caused by damage to Wernicke's area, also in the left hemisphere and the posterior language area. Afflicted individuals seem unaware of their deficits uh, with aphasia. And in the case of Wernicke's aphasia, the deficits in spoken word recognition 
language comprehension and in converting thoughts into words is what we describe as anomia and averbia. In this illustration from a positron emission tomography study, um, which also examines brain function, we can see that the superior temporal lobe um, that responds to speech sounds is differently activated um, than when someone hears intelligible speech, speech that's normal um, and sensible. Mirror neurons in the primary motor cortex are also activated when we hear speech sounds. So when we say syllables loud versus when we say syllables silently to ourselves or hear syllables, there are corresponding brain regions uh, that are activated. This illustration is almost an extension of the discussion of mirror neurons in that it shows relative activation of regions of the motor cortex that control movements of certain body parts. Remember the, the motor cortex is somatotopically organized, but when people read verbs that describe movements of those particular body parts, um, so biting uh, invokes um, activation of the, the face neurons, um, slapping and kicking of the arm uh, and leg neurons respectively. In this illustration, you see a comparison of transcortical sensory aphasia and Nicky's aphasia. So with transcortical sensory aphasia, um, this is caused by damage to the posterior language area. In this case, patients cannot understand the meaning of words, but they can repeat them. Traditional Wernicke's aphasia is caused by damage to both regions and patients can neither understand the meanings of words nor repeat them. In the case of the transcortical sensory aphasia, there's a direct connection between Wernicke's area and Broca's area that enables patients with um, TC, I'm sorry, TSA, transcortical sensory aphasia, to repeat the words that they cannot actually understand. With conduction aphasia, we have speech that's fluent and meaningful. We have good comprehension, but very poor repetition. This is caused by damage to the arcuate fasciculus and suggests a direct connection between Wernicke's area and Broca's areas. Um, a secondary pathway between the posterior language area and Broca's area is indirect and is based on the meaning of words, not the sounds they make and um, may therefore be involved. In this illustration from a diffusion tensor imaging uh, MRI study, you can see the arcuate fasciculus um, well articulated. Uh, the right part is a posterior segment that goes directly to the Wernicke's area. Uh, the inverted U-bend at the top right um, goes to the inferior parietal lobe and the top left part is the anterior segment and it goes to Broca's area. As I mentioned earlier, damage to the arcuate fasciculus is involved in conduction aphasia, um, you know, as indicated by direct connections between Wernicke's and Broca's areas, and that um, a second pathway between the posterior language area and Broca's area um, is involved in deciphering the meaning of words as opposed to the sounds they make. Um, that is illustrated here, where on the upper right-hand corner um, of the illustration or uh, towards the, um, the caudal um, or occipital uh, lobe, you can see that one arrow flows from the posterior language area into Broca's area 
and um, is labeled as a connection that enables patients with conduction aphasia to express their thoughts in words. In keeping with the potential for spoken and read language to or words to activate parts of the motor cortex, it isn't terribly surprising to see that sign language um, impacts uh, the brain in similar ways and that aphasia can exist or present in people who are deaf. So with sign language, um, we have um, expression through the movements of hands, commonly in American Sign Language, for instance. Um, there's left hemispheric uh, lateralization, um, as with spoken language. Um, and some believe that sign language may, in fact, be a precursor of spoken language. Uh, and clearly this involves, as you can see from this PET scan, uh, showing activation of the inferior left uh, frontal lobe when a person saw finger movement. This involves uh, mirror neuron activation. In this illustration, you can see that there's correspondence in terms of pattern of brain activation um, in uh, keeping with a rhyming task for both deaf and hearing people. In this image of stuttering um, compared to fluent speech production, we see the results of a meta-analysis where they take lots of studies together in order to arrive at some common conclusions that shows lots of different cortical brain regions are involved in stuttering, um, with the exception of one cerebellar region, the cerebellar vermis. Um, stuttering is characterized by pauses, the prolongation of sounds or the repetition of sounds, sometimes syllables or words that disrupt normal flow of speech. Uh, it's thought to be influenced by genetic factors and or some abnormal auditory feedback. It's caused by abnormalities in some cases in the neural mechanisms involved in planning and initiation of speech, but these can be overcome. In this illustration, you can see the results of an fMRI study that showed um, regions of the superior temporal lobe increasing in activity one year after a successful course of therapy to combat or, or um, treat stuttering. And a um, perfect example of someone overcoming stuttering is uh, President-elect uh, Joe Biden, who um, has worked really hard uh, to overcome that tendency, that difficulty, and uh, really persevered and succeeded and represents a model for others. We are now going to consider the relationship between aphasia and pure alexia, as well as try to understand um, some of the neurological bases of reading and writing. You may be wondering by now what are the differences really between aphasia, um, abnormal reading and writing, and alexia. So brain damage can also produce reading and writing disorders. Aphasias, however, you are usually accompanied by parallel reading and writing deficits. With pure alexia, we have um, certain symptoms that are identifiable, such as um, the loss of ability to read without the loss of the ability to write. Um, it can be produced by brain damage um, in some cases. Uh, in any event, people can often recognize words that are spelled aloud um, quite distinctively. With 
pure alexia, visual information is prevented from reaching the visual association cortex. And so patients have difficulty with visual and not auditory input. In this rather complicated figure, you can see that alexia, pure alexia, involves um, interruption via brain damage to uh, the left primary visual cortex and also uh, some interruption of the flow of information um, uh, due to damage of the posterior corpus callosum. Here is an illustration um, documenting alexia without agraphia in a case of multiple sclerosis where the person developed pure alexia um, because of damage to the white matter um, in the left visual cortex. Reading involves two processes. First, there's whole word reading and there's also phonetic reading. Studies of dyslexias have provided information about the brain mechanisms involved in reading, um, particularly through our exploration of acquired dyslexia versus developmental dyslexia. With acquired dyslexias, um, there are two types. There's surface dyslexia and direct dyslexia. With surface dyslexia, the deficit stems from whole word reading. With direct dyslexia, the deficit has to do with understanding words that are written. In contrast to surface dyslexia and direct dyslexia, phonological dyslexia has to do with a deficit in sounding words out. Studies of kana and kanji symbols help illustrate this. Kanji represents whole words. Kana represents sounds, not whole words. Examples of kanji include a symbol for the word time. Another example might be a symbol for the word tree. Um, another example shows two tree symbols together that could represent a forest, for instance. Kana um, examples, uh, there are two sections here for hiragana and katakana. They show the different letters and what sounds they make. In any event, the visual word form area or VWFA is critically important for phonological and whole word reading um, where it plays a central role. Parts of the VWFA or the visual association cortex um, word form area have to be involved in perceiving written words and damage to the VWFA produces surface dyslexia and impaired whole word reading. As you might predict based on the um, wide array or diversity of uh, written and spoken um, human languages, there's a lot of plasticity in the VWFA. Written language is thought to be a relatively recent invention and so this brain plasticity allowed the development of language and writing systems that uh, overlap with the necessary functions um, of various cultures. Fluency and literacy can develop quickly uh, and there's an importance of constancy in the visual system such as ways that lines meet at certain vertices. So for example, the letters L, T, and X. In case you've been wondering how um, handwriting compares to typing, I'm including this illustration that shows that typing um, interacts in a manner that's similar to writing with regard to um, brain functions. So it's not any different, uh, really. And so what is the role of the brain 
in reading and writing. Um, dysgraphia is writing disturbance. It's common in dyslexia. There are many brain regions involved. Um, certain motor aspects uh, include the dorsal parietal cortex and premotor cortex. It's thought that brain damage can disrupt the ability to form letters or even impair the ability to spell in some instances. So why is the motor cortex involved um, at all in writing, whether we're typing or handwriting? So skills used in writing include audition, the sense of hearing, vision, memorization, so that has to do with learning and memory, but also motor memory. And so the ventral premotor cortex is critically important here. Um, with regard to the neural basis of writing, we know that brain damage can impair writing, leading to phonolo phonological dysgraphia or orthographic dysgraphia, um, as well as memory deficits. So direct dysgraphia is similar to direct dyslexia, meaning that the individual has difficulty um, with some aspect of, of writing and we'll talk more about that momentarily. This handy table compares the brain regions involved in disorders of reading and writing. Um, basically, you can see that with pure alexia, people can write. Um, with surface dyslexia, um, uh, we have difficulty or, or a poverty of whole word reading. Um, that matches what you see in Alexia. Um, there's also, with surface dyslexia, better phonetic reading than you find in pure Alexia. Um, in surface dyslexia, it's the VWF area, again, that's involved by contrast to pure Alexia, where the left primary visual cortex and posterior corpus callosum are involved. Also, you can see that um, both phonological dyslexia and direct dyslexia, where the person can't comprehend words, have good whole word reading, but poor phonetic reading. And in the case of phonological dyslexia, it's not only the VFW, VWFA, but um, maybe some uh, temporal parietal cortical areas, the inferior frontal cortex, including possibly Broca's area that's involved. Uh, with direct dyslexia, we have left frontal and temporal lobe involvement. When we compare uh, the disorders of writing, we can see that there is good whole word writing in both phonological dysgraphia and in semantic agraphia or direct dysgraphia where people can't comprehend words but poor whole word writing in orthographic dysgraphia. With phonetic writing, we again see parallelism between the phonological dysgraphia and the semantic agraphia or direct dysgraphia, where there's a poverty for both. And um, by contrast, or conversely, good phonetic writing with orthographic uh, dysgraphia. So the differences between phonological and orthographic dysgraphia appear to be in terms of the phonological case involving Broca's area, the ventral precentral gyrus, and the insula, whereas the orthographic case involves posterior inferior temporal cortex regions. And that concludes your lecture on human communication.